Can you hear me in the back okay? Sweet. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ankit and I'm very excited uh, and privileged actually uh, for this talk to be able to talk to you about uh, my experience in uh, open source collaboration and healthcare IT. Uh, as someone who's a healthcare provider and not necessarily you know, an everyday programmer. So in my talk I'd like to make across three main points. Uh, the first is that open source and open source philosophy is fantastic. Uh, the second is that uh, vaccines cannot be too hot or too cold. And the third is that good workflow actually saves, saves lives, especially in a high volume setting in places where I work, like hospitals and clinics. So uh, I'm a final year family medicine resident at the uh, Toronto East General Hospital at U of T. Uh, and I'm excited to be transitioning into independent practice in the next several months. Um, I know what you're thinking, uh, how is this guy remotely qualified to give you any sort of computer science talk? Uh, he got kicked out of the Google campus for trying to bite, in, bite into like a metal marshmallow. <laughs> but uh, I've had a long-standing interest in computer science and software development. Uh, it really wasn't until my first uh, project in undergrad which, where I really appreciated what the benefits of an open source philosophy could have towards software development. <laughs> Uh, so during my undergrad, I developed, along with another graduate student, uh, a program which correlated pollution data with wind patterns uh, to create kind of this northern, this pollution forecast map of the northern hemisphere. And when we first published the first couple of papers with that, um, I first initially only released the code as closed source, so I only released like a black box type of executable. Um, but after a couple of years of adding a little more functionality to the program, I decided to release it as open source, so I, I posted it on GitHub, or, or Google Code at that time, uh, and uh, then to GitHub. Uh, and I was surprised at the amount of more emails that we got from research, researchers around the world, like Serbia, um, Portugal, China, and they, instead of, you know, they were telling us that instead of spending a number of years kind of trying to kind of reproduce the work that we already did, they were able to verify the code that I already wrote and expand on the functionality of the program that I created to, in order to solve their own subspecialized types of air quality problems. So, I took away a couple of points from that. Uh, the first was that uh, there are other version control systems than other than Subversion, and Git is awesome. And I think we're going to talk about that. So, thanks. Uh, and that an open source philosophy can can actually solve a lot of problems, especially in the academia world, where you know instead of redundantly building on redundantly trying to reproduce this, reproduce work that's been already done, uh, we can just expand on functionality that already exists. So, big problems, fast forward to kind of medical school and residency, um, where uh, we ran into one of the big problems we had was uh, vaccine wastage, uh, for which cold chain incidents or refrigeration system failures can be responsible for about 5% of all the vaccines we administer in Canada being wasted. So that translates to somewhere to the tune of millions or millions of dollars. Um, and there was one particular incident in the clinic that I work at where about there was one overnight incident where a fridge motor burned out and about fifty to sixty thousand dollars of vaccines were actually wasted in one night um, because they were out of their range for temperature. Uh, and those were that caused a delay in healthcare firstly. We, we couldn't administer you know necessary vaccines to people who were coming in the next day and he had to wait a couple of days for the fridge to be resupplied by the government and by the patients. Uh, and then there were, paid, there were some vaccines that were privately paid for by patients um, that were wasted because they rely on our types of refrigeration systems in order to safely store their vaccines as well. So um, this looked like a job for, as part of uh, the quality improvement project that uh, we did, this looked like a job for a Raspberry Pi uh, running a LAMP stack and the Twitter API. So, the way this works is that, uh, yes, our fridge tweets, actually. <laughs> so the way this works is that uh, there is a temperature sensor uh, that's connected to the Raspberry Pi via its GPIO ports. Uh, there's a Python script, and the Raspberry Pi runs a LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, uh, and PHP. And there's a Python script which just basically pulls uh, the temperature data from the fridge every certain number of minutes, so every about five to 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then dumps that into a MySQL database. Uh, the MySQL database is then used along with the rest of the LAMP stack to serve that data to uh, a web page, which can be locally accessed by anybody or any computer in the clinic. Uh, and then the data can be graphically represented. So I ended up using like, the Google Finances, the Google Charts API to try to graphically represent the data. Um, 
if the temperature falls out of range, there's a Twitter API as well as an emailing service which runs in the background, uh, which then notifies the clinic administrator of the temperatures becoming out of range so that uh, they can be alerted to uh, take any kind of preventative action before the vaccines spend too much time outside of that temperature range so that the vaccines can be saved. And so essentially I think this worked out pretty well for the first couple of weeks that this was deployed. Uh, but uh, I ran into a couple of problems. Uh, the first was that the temperature probe actually wasn't really properly calibrated. Uh, so uh, my, clinic my clinic administrator, uh, let's call him Roy, actually I think that's his real name, so uh, uh, he received about 150 emails over the space of 24 hours. Uh, and uh, he wasn't super happy about that. I think he very sarcastically emailed me. He said, hey, are you getting lots of alerts? And of course I wasn't because I didn't program my email to, to, to <laughs> uh, But he was. And so I think after we calibrated the temperature probe and uh, reset the notification specials, because I think they were quite stringent, um, the number of emails he received drastically reduced down to almost zero a day. Uh, and it's working quite well now. The second barrier we had to this was the more traditional staff uh, kind of being resistant to try to adopt a new system as part of their workflow. Uh, so the way it traditionally works is that uh, nursing staff and clinic administrators will just commonly check the temperatures a couple of times a day uh, on their own manually during office hours. But given that this gives you more tighter control and tighter monitoring of fridge temperatures, I think they adopted it quite quickly once they realized that all you had to do to check the temperature was literally log into a web page. Uh, so it wasn't too difficult after that. Um, so this was the, the next project I was involved with. Um, I was working out in a critical care department of a hospital, uh, in a hospital out in the GCA. And uh, I found uh, there was a 62-year-old gentleman who came to me in the emergency department um, saying that he had no sensation and no motor control of his left hand. So he couldn't move it, couldn't move it around, had no sensation whatsoever. I suspected stroke. Protocols for stroke say that you have to order a CT scan within 60 minutes of someone actually presenting to the hospital. Uh, that's because that's the appropriate amount of time um, that is needed in order to save as much brain tissue as possible. And second is that stroke is an urgent problem and we need urgent types of imaging modalities to be able to cope with that and to be able to investigate before we pursue any more medical treatment. Um, so I ended up ordering, I ended up entering my uh, order into the EMR system. Uh, I put it in, I said stat CT head, rule out a stroke. Um, I entered it in, went off to do my work. Um, this gentleman, uh, unfortunately, he got a CT scan 90 minutes afterwards, instead of, the, instead of the maximum amount of 60, which we normally recommend. And by that time, his CT scan looked something like that which looks really bad. Um, there's a big dark spot that you can see on the left side of the image that the arrow is pointing towards. Um, and that represents the right side of his brain. Uh, that was all dead tissue or dying tissue or tissue which was at risk of dying very imminently. Uh, he ended up, by the time he got his CT scan, he ended up having no sensation on the entire left side of his body and no sensation, no motor control of his left or right hand at all. In talking to the radiologist technician about this, um, who, who I was asking him, you know, why, why was there such a delay in getting this gentleman his CT head scan? Uh, why did it take so long and why did this result in an adverse out a health outcome for him? Uh, and it turns out that uh, there's, there's two systems in the uh, hospital where I was working at. There's the EMR system, the electronic medical record system which manages all of the orders uh, and charting for patients and their care. And then the Department of Radiology has its own kind of internal software workflow system which interfaces with EMR. And sometimes, for whatever reason, it could be infrastructure related or it could be software related, uh, there's a bug that exists that allows for a lot of latency to occur between those two systems. Uh, and as a result, the radiology department either doesn't receive the order at all uh, meaning that you have to phone in an order again, or you have to chase it down uh, in order for it to get done. Uh, or secondly, uh, the order comes in at a very late time because there's a lot of latency that exists between the two systems. Um, so 
I mean, I didn't find that super acceptable. I mean, this gentleman ended up having pretty a pretty bad functional outcome as a result of a delay in his imaging and a delay in his treatment. And so that kind of motivated me to, um, when I went to the Linux conference in, in 2016 in August in Toronto, um, I met a couple of developers that uh, were responsible for developing open source EMR systems to combat problems like this uh, and other issues that we experience in healthcare as well. So uh, that's a four. OpenMRS is a OpenMRS was the project that uh, I was acquainted with at the Linux conference, and uh, OpenEMR is another system. Those are two EMR systems uh, bundled with those types of uh, radiology information systems that radiology departments use um, that uh, help to kind of reduce the latency and help to bring uh, help to bring more of an open source philosophy uh, to healthcare. Uh, and become more collaborative like that. And Libre Health was a, is a project that I'm involved in, which is uh, a non-literal fork of OpenMRS and OpenEMR. So OpenMRS is deployed a lot in developing countries. Uh, it was used in the, if anybody remembers the 2015 Ebola outbreak, um, it was used in Africa for that. So it was deployed on like low-cost tablets, which were very sterilizable and very cleanable at that time. Uh, and OpenEMR is a popular system used in the states, in a lot of hospitals and clinics around the states as well. And LibreHealth was kind of, uh, LibreHealth is more of a community as well as consists of an EMR system, um, which is a fork of those two, but also is able to bring together, has a goal of bringing together both developing and developed countries uh, to create more of a global community around open source healthcare. And right now I'm involved in uh, developing user stories as well as documentation and beta testing for um, the radiology module that interfaces with LibreHealth, which interfaces with the actual EMR system, um, because of the motivation that, because of the experience that I had in, in uh, that uh, hospital uh, with the, with the gentleman with the stroke. Um, so I learned a couple of things from that experience, and then and a lot of people can get involved with LibreHealth. We're always looking for contributors uh, in any way. Uh, if I can do it, you definitely, definitely can do it as well. Um, so I learned about a few things, uh, a few points I wanted to make about um, uh, my experience in, with that stroke as well as with Libre Health is that, firstly, this is more for myself, but I mean, time is brain. Um, so, and logically, I mean, if good workflow saves time uh, and good design, so good, good code then leads to good workflow, then I really think that, um, you know, good code can have the potential to save lives. Um, good code is responsible for designing good workflow. And workflow is so crucial to a lot of hospitals and a lot of the type of work that I do where I have to manage very large patient volumes. And if there are barriers to end users like myself, then I think that leads to poorer health outcomes. And uh, this, was, this was something that someone told me uh, at the Linux conference was that um, People before code uh, means that listening to the community uh, is kind of paramount before developing and implementing any kind of code or design. And I think that really rings true for, for medicine, especially where you know your code has the ability to really impact the healthcare and the types of outcomes that we see. So that was my talk. Thank you.